I think you all know me. I'm Jens. I'm giving a, my very personal introduction to functional programming with Lisp and Emacs Lisp. I'm actually talking a little bit about common Lisp as well, because as we talked about before the talk, um, there are some differences that are important to know because you're not just um, hopefully learning functional programming with Emacs Lisp, but you're also learning functional programming. So I will also highlight where there are limitations in Emacs Lisps that you may need to work around. So um, this is sort of an overview, attempted overview of all the talks. So we've seen the, in talk one, we talk mostly about the functional programming and how you program without side effects or you program with side effects when the things that you manipulated were not seen by any other things. Like if you had a list that was a temporary list, it would be better to, to sort it by moving things around rather than creating a copy and sorting that. This talk uh, will look a little bit about labels and stuff that we saw that we used previously for recursive um, recursive local functions. And I will talk about const cells today. Um, I said I would talk about lists, but we've looked at lists in the previous talk from the perspective of processing lists with recursion or with mapping functions. And today we'll look at some of the other applications of lists that um, are not recursion and mapping functions. But before I do that, I will first give you a quick summary of the second talk. If you found all that stuff confusing, then this is my ad, um, attempt to, to summarize things concisely. So you saw when we mapped through a list, either through recursions or through a mapping function, the, the function that you apply would either look at the single element of the list and then it would generate a result out of that or it would look at the whole sublist if you CDR across the list and you look at the sublist as you CDR across it. And uh, there are different mappings functions for that. So the first column shows that uh, your options, if you have a single valued results, so every time the function that you call on your list, it returns a single result. And those are put together in a, res in a new list, which will be your result list. The other option is if you have multiple results, including none, where you return a list from your function and then they will those lists will be spliced together. And if it, if your function call just sees the first element as with mapcar, then, then mapcan is your function. And if you want to see the whole sublist as you CDR across the list, then mapcon is your function. And then the results get nconc, they get destructively spliced together. So your function will need to create the fresh list of results that you need to, to splice together every time. What we didn't look at was those that just call the function for side effect. So map and maple just call the function for side effect, which is useful where um, in the, the example we looked at where you're looking for a, a a particular state, a particular goal or something in there, and then you throw a I found it exception when when you find it. And in that case, you're just looking for the side effect. And you and um, in that case, you don't want the map function to return anything at all. And um, they just return nil. They, they basically discard the result. We also look very briefly at functions that just act on, on sequences. Sequences are more than lists. They can also be vectors and strings. And um, uh, so there are mapping functions there that can also, uh, like map, can return a different kind of sequence from the one that you started with. And we didn't really look at reduce, but we used reduce a lot in a, as a pattern in the recursive functions. So other things we saw is that nil is very powerful because you can have, um, not just as, does it mean false, as in many other languages, the empty list evaluates to false, but the converse is true as well. So false evaluates to the empty list. So you could do something like this. Um, if you remember IO test, a function that generates numbers from zero to n or n minus one. So you could say um, if n, if k is bigger than one, then you, you call yourself recursively. And if not, then you just get nil, which is the empty list, which you then cons things onto. So you can actually write things very concisely. Another example is this one, if you had NPCDDRW, then it says W has zero to two elements. 
because if W has zero or one or two elements, then uh, CDR of nil is nil. And then eventually you'll get to, to NP says, is this thing that I look at an, an empty list? So it's a very concise way of, of doing something that in what I call inferior languages will take much, much more space. Okay, uh, some of the meditations from talk two, um, if you remember, if you don't remember, then don't worry about it. Um, and or and if, and and that's kind of those kind of functions are not functions. So you can't actually you cannot actually call them with fun call because they're not functions. As we saw before, um, and we'll do a shortcut. So if this first thing evaluates to nil, the second thing will not evaluate at all, which means that it cannot be a function. If we'll do a uh, so obviously it will either evaluate the then or the else. So also it cannot be a function. So you cannot apply them as if they were functions. The search uh, where I try to look up the month number, we'll answer that later in this talk. Why do I need to copy a list before I sort it? Because sort destroys its argument. So this was the thing we talked about in talk one. You are allowed to destroy things that cannot be seen by anything else. In fact, you're encouraged to do so for efficiency reasons. But uh, so it's just one of the things you have to know that sort destroys its argument. So I need to make a copy of it. The same thing is um, if I write list one, two, three, four, then it creates a list of these four elements. If I write quote one, two, three, four, it is not the same because quote one, two, three, four is assumed to be constant. So I'm not allowed to destroy it. Whereas in list one, two, three, four, I'm allowed to destroy it because it's a, it's a freshly created list. The difference is that in quote one, two, three, four, it is the reader that creates the list when it reads it. And then it doesn't evaluate it further because there's a quote on it. In this construction, when I say list one, two, three, four, it is the evaluator that creates the list because it calls the function list, which creates a fresh list for me. So, um, so I know that it's a fresh list and it's not constant or anything. Okay, uh, so the other thing I wanted to briefly cover before we go into the main topic of today is when to use labels and when not to use labels. So if you remember the IOTA function, which creates a list of integers from, uh, from one to K or zero to K minus one, it doesn't really matter. Uh, there are two different versions of that in this, in this slide. The first one, as you can see, uses labels, and then it has the helper function that we call, which it just calls itself to build the list that we want to, to, to look at. And the second one has factored that function out as a separate standalone function. And otherwise they're identical. So the question is, when should I use labels and when should I not use labels? So the answer is that there is no answer because it's pretty much a matter of taste and, and convenience. Um, the standalone function is easier to debug, easier to write. You can trace it if you want to. You can unit test it. If in common Lisp, there's an RT package that I use a lot, uh, which means regression testing, I think. Uh, and um, in labels, you cannot call the function once it's inside because it's it's scoped inside of its parent function. Now it also means that it can call things from its parent scope. So in labels, in the labels option, if I wanted to access the K, that is the parameter to the to the parent function, I can actually do that within this helper function, which is sometimes very useful and sometimes is very dangerous because if I've mistyped my K1 here and written K or, or this one perhaps, and I have done that in, in recursive calls, then obviously the function will not work and it will not tell me why it's not working because K is perfectly accessible inside of the, the helper function. Uh, that would not happen here. If I wrote K instead of K1 here, then, then the compiler would complain when I read it or, or in Emacs it will compla complain at runtime. So it's pretty much a matter of taste. You can choose to develop as a standalone function, debug it, and then once it works, you can put it in as labels. Uh, you can also choose to just put shorter functions in as, as labels. 
I tend to use flat if it's just a local function. We'll see some examples later. Um, if if I know they call recursively, then I use labels. It's sort of an in indication to the reader of the code, as well as to the compiler that I'd intend to call it for recursion if I use labels. And if I'm not using recursion, then I just use flat. But these are pretty much matters of taste. The other thing you might notice as a functional programmer is that, of course, your, pro your program consists of functions. And when you write those, you can, if I just do this diff on foo, uh, then if odd pk, then call bar k, but bar k is not defined yet, that's perfectly fine. In SPCL, it will complain when it reads it because bar k is not defined yet. But as long as I keep passing it even k, then this bar k is never called and the, func the function works perfectly happily. And I can even put a stub in, which will look perhaps something like this in Emacs. Uh, so this is just a temporary function that uh, reads the number and it um, from, from input, it puts something into the display buffer and reads it and converts it to a number and returns that number. So it'll basically ask me every time. And, and that's just there until I put the proper function in. So if if my choice was to do top-down programming, this would actually be a very helpful way of, of doing things, but I can just stub things till I get the real thing um, put in. And in Lisp, if the function foo were compiled, for example, it would still work. It would not need to recompile when I redefine bar, which is which is nice. There are very, very few cases where you would need for for really special cases of optimization where you need to recompile foo when you change bar. And we will really only touch upon them once in under the advanced topics. Okay, now let's get on to the main topic for today, the const cell. So all of this stuff on this slide, I will assume that you know. So const is a function that creates a pair. The pair has a car and a CDR and uh, which is sort of the first element of the pair and the second element of the pair. And we'll look at other ways of doing pairs if you if you don't like const cells, but I know you like const cells because you like Emacs. So in a, in a normal list, the CDR, the last CDR must always be nil. So all the stuff we talked about with recursion and mapping and all of the things we did in talk to only works on proper lists. So today we will be looking at some lists that are not proper lists. So they will not work with mapping and recursion and they will still do something useful. Like the list function before, you can ask the reader to create a dotted pair and that's where the dot comes in. The dot tells the reader that the CDR follows. So if I say two dot nil, it basically says a two and then the CDR is nil, which is the same as just a list of one element two, because in a normal list, the CDR is always nil, the last CDR. If I say two dot list AB, it says that the CDR following the two is the list AB, which is just a list of two AB, because that's how normal lists are made, that the CDR always points to the next link in the list. So I, with that in mind, I, I, I hope you're familiar with that because you will need that as we go into the next thing. So what I wanted to look at is a special thing called A-lists, which is short for association lists. And I know I have a lot of text on these slides and I'm not gonna read all the text obviously because um, the, the slides are designed to be readable independently of the talk. So um, I will just cover the, the, the basic things that are happening on the slide. So what I want to do is to create an, uh, an association list where I can look up keys and values. So here is one that maps A to one, B to two, and C to three. A, B, and C are symbols, and one, two, and three are obviously numbers. So you can see when I use the ASOC function to look up B in, in the A list, then I get the pair B.2. I can use the re reverse lookup with RASOC and it looks up the value three and returns C dot three. And then I look up an element that doesn't exist at all. And it just gives me nil because it's not there in the list. So the association list is a way of mapping keys to values that is 
really, really simple and really, really efficient, and uh, at least for a small number of values, and it is used a lot in Emacs, and we'll see examples of that as well. Before we get to that, I want you to have a think about why is it better to reduce to return the whole cell. When I look up the value b, you might think, should it not just return the value that I'm interested in? Uh, sorry, b would be over here, wouldn't it? And when I look up, do a reverse lookup with three, should it not just return the key that I'm looking for? So why is it better for it to return the whole cell? So I want you to spend a few seconds thinking about this. The other thing to note is if I don't need to do a reverse lookup, then it doesn't have to be a dotted pair because ASOC just looks at the car of the list and just returns whatever it finds. So if I have a proper list in there and I say, uh, look it up just by matching the car, it will return that list perfectly well. So it, it's just a convenience function. Often you will see these dotted pairs in A lists but it, they don't actually have to be dotted pairs. They can be proper lists if you don't need the reverse lookup or a mixture of both even. So why do we need the pairs? The first reason is you might use a predicate to look up. So instead of ASOC, I use ASOC if, uh, so it finds an, an even number, an even key, uh, where the keys now are numbers rather than the other way around. The keys are um, not symbols anymore. And it returns the whole thing because I'm interested in what the key is as well. Or I might want to modify the value after I found it. So um, uh, the first let, who should this be a let star? I think that should be a let star. That's a typo, sorry about that. Um, when it finds a lookup value, then it replaces, it takes that cell and replaces the CDR. And then you can see that the value has indeed been replaced in, in the cell. I do test this code, but it must have been a typo in the transcription. Or the other thing you can do is uh, distinguish between a value that doesn't exist and a, a value that is nil. So for example, if I had 2.nil in my A list and I look up two, then it returns 2.nil, except the printer writes it as just a list two. If I then look up a symbol that doesn't exist as a key, then it just returns nil. So um, the other way of I can modify an entry is by looking, by doing a set on the cell. So if I wanted to, if I start here, I've used the let star as I should. Um, so I have one A, two B, three C as before. And I look up the, the cell associated with an even key and it finds this cell and replaces the CDR. The catch, of course, is that if the lookup fails, this will explode because CDR ASOC if will return nil, CDR nil is nil, and set for nil is illegal. So it will raise an exception at runtime if, if the lookup fails, which is also why I had this when here. In case the lookup fails, it's not going to do anything at all. In contrast, I won't talk much about hashes, but hashes do get created if they don't exist. So if I create an empty hash and I set an entry in there, uh, which does not exist, then the entry automatically gets created. So, um, so that's quite useful. So these key value lists, the A lists are very important in Lisp and, and in Emacs as well. And they have some helper functions that are quite useful. A cons is basically short for doing two consists. You cons the key value together first, and then you cons them onto the list that is the rest of, of your list, which is actually really useful when you look at it. So here I declare a local function just, just looks up A, the simple A in, in an A list and returns the value associated with it. And if, the, if A doesn't exist in the list, then it'll just go into it will just return nil. So here you can see A maps one, B to two and C to three as before. So if I call lookup A, it will obviously return one. But now I A cons the key A and the value seven on, in front of it, which now returns an extended A list 
that has an entry in front of it with a in it. So there are, now there are two key, um, key value pairs in there that have the key a. And the one that maps a to seven is the one that comes before the other one. So that means that when I now call lookup a on the extended a list, it returns seven. And then I return, I, I go back to the normal uh, entry as before, and it just returns one. So hopefully you can see this is a nice functional way of doing lookups and changing the lookup table temporarily in a function call. So it, it's actually very important. Uh, you can, so, uh, and we'll return to this concept later, um, several times actually, because it's so important that the key that maps the, the pair that maps A to seven shadows the other one in the table that is already in the table because ASOC always returns the first entry that it finds. So we say that it, it shadows the one that is already in the table. And we'll see many examples of, of this as we go along. Meanwhile, here's another helper function. Um, there's uh, this concept of putting stuff in front of an, an A-list to add to it can also be done with several key and keys and values. So uh, there's a special function called pairless, which will take several keys and several values and put them in front of, of the A-list that I had before. I've sort of called it dict as incompatibility with Python, but it is actually an A-list, uh, an association list, in, obviously. So the lookup A does the same as before, and this time it will look up the value 13 because C maps to 12 and A maps to 13 in my, uh, my um, temporary A-list, extended A-list. The order in which they are added is unspecified by the standard, but Emacs, in fact, will add them in the order that they're described. So the keys that you put in here have to be different. Otherwise, the, the behavior is undefined. So let's see how this is useful, because as I said, Emacs uses A-lists. And one of the good examples, I think, is auto mode A-list, which tells Emacs how to map the file that you load to a mode. And you can see that there are 266 entries in my Emacs installation. And here, I know this is not a very functional way of doing things, but, but bear with me for a moment. Um, I put a new entry in front of auto mode a list, which maps the, the files with .r extension into text mode. Then I open a file uh, with an R extension. And if the file exists, it will indeed open in text mode. Because the new entry that I just put onto the a list shadows the old one that is still in there. When I pop it away again, then it reverts to its normal behavior that maps R dot r files into r mode. So um, it is actually a very useful way to temporarily modify how Emacs handles things. Now, there are several ways that, uh, as you know, a file can be mapped into a mode. And I think the auto mode a list is the fourth one or something in the sequence. So if any of the other ones has a different opinion, then this code will not be, be used. But um, but you should be able to see that the auto mode a list and, and you know changing a lists is quite an important way of, of um, possibly temporarily changing the behavior of Emacs. So here's an interesting exercise for you. Suppose you're given an a list that maps a to one, b to two, and b to three. If you look up b, it will map to two because the first entry will be found. Now the question is, we want to remove this entry that maps B to two, so that the entry that maps B to three is seen. Now here, I popped it out of the list because I knew it was the first one because I put it there. Now I want you to think about how would you do it if the pair is not necessarily the first pair of the, of the A list. So that's an exercise. There's more than one solution. And uh, so the more solutions you can think of, the more points you score. <laughs>
the other thing I wanted to cover is uh, you can build sets with lists, obviously. So this is where the order in which they appear doesn't really matter. So if I create a list here and I create it with the function list, so it's not a constant, uh, and it, con it contains some numbers in it, and I say delete duplicates, then it will sure enough to delete duplicates and give me the, the list of unique entries in that list, which is what I need if I want to treat it as a set. And you'll recall that there are destructive versions and non-destructive versions. Uh, so if I set remove duplicates, it would be non-destructive. It would create a copy of the list with the unique elements in it. Whereas uh, it is safe to call delete in this case because uh, this is a temporary list that is not seen by anything else. And I can do lots of other things like intersections of lists and unions of lists and set differences and, and stuff like that. And if you if you allow to destroy them, then there are also n versions. So there's an n intersection, an n union, and n set difference that destroy their their arguments. Um, I should also say that you can also build trees with with lists, and I will not really cover that, at least not today, but maybe at the very end of the the sequence of talks, I will talk more about trees. Because um, you might have noticed that Lisp code is a tree. It's a tree structure, sort of the lists that are. are... So there's some interesting things we can do with trees, but I think it'll, it'll have to wait till later. For now, the one thing you have to be aware of is when you look up things in, whether you look them up in a lists or you look them up in sets, you have to know how they're compared with each other. So. If I didn't use symbols, if I use strings as keys in my A list in Emacs, this would actually work. I would look up the string ABC, it will find the matching entry, whoops, and it will indeed return one. If I ran the same thing in common Lisp, it would fail. Because this string ABC is a different string from the other ABC because they're different sequences. They're just different objects and they would not compare. And that's because in Emacs Lisp, the default test function for ASOC is, is equal, which compares lists um, and sequences the way that you intend to. So the, the string ABC contains the same characters as the string ABC, so they're considered the same. But in common Lisp, the default is EQL. So the lookup here will fail because it uses the EQL test function. Because the, these two strings are constructed, when the reader reads this, it reads the string ABC, and then it reads the string ABC, and it constructs a string every time, but those two strings are different. Perhaps the compiler at some point later might notice that they, they have the same contents and make them the same string to save a bit of space. But, uh, and indeed it would be allowed to do that, but, um, at this point, we haven't compiled anything yet, or maybe we have and the compiler hasn't done the optimization. So they are indeed different. So in common Lisp, I have to give it a test function that says equal, and then it works as intended. EQL just looks at comparison between objects and numbers and, say, and says, are these the same objects or are they the same numbers? Whereas equal looks inside the object and and checks them uh, checks the elements if if the objects are sequences. Now this is important because if you remember uh, before this before the talk started, we talked a little bit about the, the CL compatibility package. Remove duplicates exists in Emacs, but you have to import it from the CL compatibility package. And the CL compatibility package, for compatibility reasons, uses EQL as its test function. So ASOC in Emacs Lisp uses equal as its test function. But remove duplicates and delete duplicates and all the other things, uh, union and, and intersection and, and whatnot, they're all pulled in from the CL package and they use EQL as their test function, even in Emacs Lisp. So you have to be aware of that. To make it work properly, you have to use a, a, a test keyword uh, 
and an equal function. And then it works as properly even in Emacs Lisp. So that's just something to be aware of, that the default test function in ASOC is sort of an anomaly. It's not like that in Common Lisp. So you have to be, uh, the way you specify it is also different. Uh, in ASOC, in Emacs Lisp, the third argument is your test function. So you could write something like um, ASOC uh, key a.1 and then the test function eql perhaps if you wanted to and it'll do the lookup whereas in common lisp you have to have the test keyword to say what your test is because there are other keywords you can specify uh, right here's another exercise um, if you remember remove duplicates from before this is the um, modifying version of that as an exercise Use what you learned in talk two to write remove duplicates. Try using a, a recursive version and try using one using mapping. It's a, actually quite an interesting exercise as well. So um, I, I recommend it. So let's do some more stuff with this. If you remember in talk two, I wanted to calculate the month number based on a short string that identified the short name of the month. A much better way of doing it would be to use a, an association list. So I have a fixed association list that maps the string Jan into one, Feb into two, and so on for all the months of the year. And I just use ASOC to look up the string in that list, which turns out to be a much, much better way of, of doing it. Previously, I had done a search inside this list and divided the, the result by, um, by three by um, when the index is returned. And um, this thing is, is actually a lot better. First of all, it's more correct because it doesn't return anything like um, any other substring matching inside of here. And it doesn't do the, the other matchings that are kind of useless across here. Like um, if I try to match three letters that are not a month name, it would still do that check, even if the check fails. So, to see which bit is better, I wrote a, a little macro that runs, um, basically runs it a number of times and uh, um, returns how long it took to, to, to calculate the expression. This macro is not the really the production version. This is just to illustrate what it looks like. So what it does is, is it takes the current timestamp, then it takes the value that it's trying to, to calculate, and then it takes the time difference between the start time and end time and consists the value that it finds onto it. So exit time for plus two, three, takes, uh, returns the result five, and it took about a microsecond and, and something. So um, if you go to my uh, GitHub repository, you will see the full list of code for, for the entire test behind this list. So I ran it 10,000 times, just looking up January, February, March, April, so evenly distributed across the, the, the list of months. If I use the search function that I had in initially, it takes nearly a second for it to run 10,000 times. So clearly it's not doing very well. If I do ASOC on the strings, then it is a lot faster. If I use get hash on the strings, then it's, about the same performance. So ASOC and get hash, you know, it doesn't really matter which one you use in, in this case because they're about the same. Obviously, if the list was much, much longer, then get hash would be faster. Uh, and if the list was, was shorter, presumably ASOC would be faster because there's some overhead in calculating hashes. If I use position, which finds the entry in, an, in a vector, so if I have a vector of January, February, March, April, and position just looks up the position in there, then it is even faster. And you can also see using symbols in there rather than strings is faster still. It's not a lot faster, but it is slightly faster because symbols are atoms and strings are sequences. So you can sort of intuitively see that an atom 
might be easier to comp compare to another atom or to itself, where for a string you have to look through the three different characters in the string. We will cover symbols in more details in a future talk as well. So this is just to show that that um, really there are there are better ways to do that lookup, and ASOC actually performs quite well. So you should not hesitate to use and maybe for 266 elements then um, it's a little maybe you should if it's a performance issue then yeah maybe you should think about optimizing it a bit but the convenience of using an association list is actually really um, useful you can do lots of things with that here's another thing that you can do with with lists occasionally i find myself needing a fifo so i want to have the first thing in being the first thing out and you, um, I usually implement those using a const cell. One, the first const cell holds the last const cell of the list, and the last const cell holds the first const cell of the list. And you can say, why is it not the other way around? And I'll invite you to think about this because uh, it's sort of as an exercise. It could easily be the other way around, but um, but uh, you may want to have a think about this. And also as an exercise, um, you may want to, to try and implement the functions that, that put something in um, to the FIFO and pop something back out of it. And also have a think about whether we can do, whether we can build a deck, a double-ended queue. Could you actually put stuff in at the end and take stuff out at the end? Could you put stuff in at the beginning and take stuff out at the beginning? So that's a little bit of an exercise in, in handling const cells. I will not say more about queues today. I will just leave you to think about it, and then we can look at, at answers to so what the answers are some other day. So other things you can do with um, when you abuse lists a, a little bit. Um, obviously, we have improper lists where the CDR is not nil. And those work quite well, except you can't recurse or map across them because they only work on proper lists. The other thing you can do is to share list, list structure, obviously, because they are const cells. So here's an example of a, a couple of, of lists that share their CDR. So their, their first entry, um, C.3 in one list and D.4 in another. But this bit A.2, B.3 is identical across both of the lists because I have just used the same base. Now this is actually useful in some contexts, either because you want to save space by having them the same if it doesn't really matter. And sometimes you actually have the, the different values, like you have different A lists with different key pairs for the, for some of them. So the first one here might override one of, might shadow one of the entries in the shared bit. So it, it can actually be useful in some contexts. The other thing you can do, which is quite fun, is to build an infinite list. So here I have a piece of code that, that takes the last const cell of the list and replaces the CDR of it with itself, with the list itself. And obviously that gives me an, an, an infinite list, which fortunately Emacs was wise enough to notice I was trying to print an infinite list and, and truncated it at some point, because otherwise it would just continue forever. So, this is a, a piece of code that creates an, an infinite list. You can even ask the reader to create an infinite list as I've done here. So the quote is here just to tell the reader not to evaluate the list because it's not a function call. It is just a list that I'm building. And my entries here are symbols, which doesn't really matter. They could be numbers as well, if you like. But what I've got here is the dotted pair, uh, the dot, that says, this, if you remember, the dot says the CDR follows and the CDR is a reference that goes back to the beginning of the list and says, the CDR is the beginning of the list. So I need the dot there because otherwise it would sort of, it would not splice the list in. But the effect of it is, is still that the reader now constructs an infinite list, which fortunately Emacs manages to notice that is an infinite list and it truncates it rather than tries to print the whole thing. Later in the advanced topics, we will look at infinite structures again, so and, and the risks of printing them as well. 
before we do that, um, I want to move on a little bit, or move back rather, to the pair that we looked at in the beginning. So I introduced the const cell inside of the association list as a pair, mapping a key to a value. Now you might think that it would be cleaner to introduce functions for that. So you might introduce a function that says make pair, which basically is an abstraction of cons. And you could introduce a pair first, which is a, a more human readable name for car, and pair second uh, that, that just returns the CDR. And um, so, so to write nice clean code, that may be your preference because then you have this abstraction and you can use some other structure later if you want to or, or, or whatever. And uh, you might find that this becomes more readable code. And there is actually a built-in way of doing that with structures. Now, many functional languages contain structures and Lisp is not an exception. So I could actually create a pair called, um, well, consisting of two elements, first and second, which are just there as entries. Um, I could actually also specify a restriction some on them, like um, what type they're supposed to have and what value they're supposed to have if they're not specified in construction. But I haven't done that here. So the, the thing to note when you'd use uh, devstruct is it creates the structure but it also creates the functions needed for the structure, unless you ask it not to. So when I create, when I use def.pair, it also creates a function called make pair, which takes a, an argument A and an argument B that are specified by the keywords. And the keywords are the same as the names that are in the structure of the, of the slots in the structure. And you can see the, the printer has printed it as, as hash S pair. What devstruct also does is to create a reader macro that uses the hash s to, as a shorthand to read a pair. So I could actually read this thing back in and it should construct that pair again as a structure. And it also creates the function pair first and uh, pair second as well as copy pair which basically copies the structure. So the structure is not a list the structure is just like a class in, uh, sort of like a class in, in many ways. Although in common Lisp at least, you can ask devstruct to create the pair using a list if you know that you need a list for some reason. And you are just introducing the, the names here as, as abstractions of, of accessing elements of the list. Now, these are also positional arguments. So you could you can turn them around and say second maps to bar and first maps to foo. If I leave one of them empty, then it will just have them, it will just be nil. Although at least in common list, I can specify a default value for those. And uh, you probably know that these things with a colon in front are keywords. So they're still symbols, but they, they evaluate to themselves. So they're not evaluated and do not need the quote. Well, they are evaluated, but they evaluate to themselves. And uh, they're just a useful way of, of, of having um, named arguments to the function. And you saw one earlier with the test, oops, test keyword. Where? With a test keyword to ASOC in common Lisp. And that's unfortunate because Emacs Lisp doesn't actually support keywords in, in, Lambda lists. So if I wanted to write that function by hand that took the pair and created the const cell, I can, in common Lisp, I can write keywords first and second, and then the function definition is it just consists them together. So it uses the const cell as the pair, but it uses the keywords to give me the arguments to cons. And in that case, um, in common Lisp, I can then specify the keyword two and keyword one, and it would create, uh, sorry, keyword second and keyword first with values two and one, and it would create the const cell as intended with the first value first and the second value second. And it is unfortunate because Emacs Lisp does not support that. So I, I could sort of do it by hand, and that is probably 
how the CL compatibility functions do it. Um, so it looks for a keyword on the first one and it looks for another keyword on the second key. And uh, the trouble is though that I couldn't specify them the other way around. So I might need to have a little think about whether that is the best way of doing it. So that's another exercise. How would you fix it if, if you were to implement keywords properly in, in Emacs Lisp? You could cheat probably and look at somebody's code because lots of people will have done this. But um, it is sort of a shame that it's a very useful feature that um, Lisp, common Lisp supports and Emacs Lisp doesn't. Um, in fact, lam Lambda Lists are extremely useful for many things. So, um, so they have lots of interesting features. Um, optional is, is supported in Emacs Lisp, but you can't give it um, a default value if it's not supplied, the default is always nil. And in common Lisp, you can give it another parameter that says, was the optional parameter actually supplied or not? So if you need to distinguish between whether the default value was used or whether the optional parameter was supplied in the function call, but it just happens to have the default value supplied to it, if that makes sense. And you can distinguish between those with the supplied P parameter in common Lisp, but it doesn't work with in Emacs Lisp, unfortunately. So you will see examples where I have tried to work around this, where I say and optional value and then the default value. Now, returning to the pairs, um, in Python, for example, there's a zip function that will take pairs and zip them up so that you get the first and second uh, it will zip up two different lists into a list of pairs. And you could implement that functionally like this. Um, if I have list one and list two, if they're both uh, non-empty, then use a const like we saw before in recursion, make pair first, first list, second, first list two. So this takes the first element of list one and first element of list two, creates a pair out of them, and then calls the calls itself recursively. And if one of the lists has come to the end of, of the list, then it will just uh, return nil. And you can see this works as before. Uh, if I have lists A, B, C and lists one, two, three, then it just creates a list of pairs um, using the structure that I had before because I used the make pair function. However, when I do this, when I need pairs in Lisp, um, to me, pairs are such low level things that I will not really bother using the, the pair structure because it's just, to me, it's just a const cell. It's just a natural thing to express a pair as a const cell. So the, the zip function as it's defined in Python is not actually, um, you don't even need it in Lisp because it's already there. As long as you, you are happy to say that a pair is a const, so you could do a map car uh, where you map the function cons onto list one and list two. Unfortunately, this doesn't really work in Emacs Lisp because a map car will only take one, a function of one argument and one list. It, it does not accept functions of two arguments with two lists here. But in common Lisp, this will truncate whenever whichever is the shorter of the lists and ignore the rest of the longer list, like this code does as well. Or you could use pairless. If you know that the lists have the same length, then pairless will automatically create the, the pairs and just add them to nil, the association list, which is nil. Okay, so Naming and abstractions is sort of, um, when you write functional code, you want to write lots, of, you probably write lots of functions because the whole point of functional code is you have lots and lots of functions that call each other in some cunning way to implement the stuff that you're doing. So having the abstractions is useful because it makes the code more readable, at least to the human who reads it. But you may also be worrying, worrying about performance for some really low level stuff like uh, creating const cells and things. So um, 
uh, in common Lisp at least, you can ask it to inline functions and, and optimizations and stuff that the compiler is good at. Um, we will look at this a little bit later. Uh, so performance is often raised as an issue in functional programming that uh, the people's perception is that functional programming has lower performance compared to the equivalent code in empirical programming. So, um, and for sure, if, if you just code things inefficiently without understanding const cells and you create fresh lists all the time and, and, and things, then you will probably get a poor performance. We shall see examples of that later as well in the, uh, of things that are intentionally created with poor performance and how to make it better. So um, this really, Honestly, it brings me to the end of today's talk, um, and we're also running out of time, which is good. So this is just a summary of the superpower tools that we've seen in the first three talks. Recursion and a list processing. In the first and second talks, we saw about normal lists and, and recursing across them. And, and today we've seen some lists that are doing interesting things with const cells, which normal languages can't do, inferior languages, I mean. We've seen uh, recursion and mapping impl implements most of the common recursion patterns really efficiently, so they don't actually exhaust the stack like you do in Emacs Lisp sometimes. And uh, all the funky stuff you can do with and and if and or and, and logic and flip and labels and macros, uh, because macros are super power tools for everything. So, um, uh, so uh, lots of good stuff that actually I feel to me like they're more powerful than some of the other thing tools in, in functional languages. So as a teaser for future talks, uh, these are the, uh, what I call advanced, quote unquote, advanced topics that I intend to cover. Some of these are quite short, like one or two slides per topic, and some of them are quite long. So um, uh, symbols is a sort of fairly longish thing Tail recursion is quite important, uh, an important concept in functional programming. Scope and extent is a very important topic in, in Lisp. Type and inference is very important in functional programming. The whole point of doing functional programming is that the, the compiler can infer things about the types and use those to validate correctness of your code and also to improve performance of your code. Um, lazy evaluation will be a lot of fun, I, I, I think. Um, this is why you have types that are not evaluated till you need them. And of course, we're at some point, we may or may not get to monads. Um, uh, monads will be a sort of a completely different change of topic. And with that, I will wrap up for today. Thank you. <laughs>